Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. It's titled Beyond Recovery with Reduced Staff Revenue Leaders Focus on Automation and Efficiency. My name is Jason Freed and I'll be moderating today. Beyond Recovery is an ongoing series of content and webinar discussions that SHR and Hotel Recovery are working on together, really aimed at helping hotels capture the most demand as travelers start getting back on the road. Before we start the webinar, I've got a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, the audio is on mute for all the attendees, but please feel free to ask questions during the presentation. I believe there is a chat window that you can ask questions in. I'll be monitoring that and get to your questions for our panelists throughout. Uh, sometimes webinars save them to the end. Uh, we like to present this more as, as a discussion, so I'll be monitoring the chat window and get to your questions for our panelists as they come up. Um, also, the session is being recorded. So tomorrow we'll send an email to all the registrants with a link to the video and slides, so look out for that. And again, like I said, this is more of a discussion than a presentation. Uh, we're gonna get to know our panelists and I'll be asking each of them some questions, really trying to get some takeaways that you, or our audience, can implement at your properties to help make a difference in your recovery efforts. So a little bit about the topic here. So efficiency, obviously, I think everybody knows, not a new goal for a hotel revenue team, something we've been talking about for a long time. But I think the pan pandemic has really accelerated efforts to do more with less. I think everybody would agree there. So we're all running a tight ship. Uh, while that's always been important in the hotel business, COVID has really taken efficient op efficiency operations to a new level. So in order to stay profitable today, some hoteliers are forced to scrape by with the bare minimum, as we know. Um, and in many cases, this meant cutting labor costs by reducing staff. So hotel operating teams don't look the same today as they did one year ago in many cases. Um, and not only revenue, we'll be talking uh, primarily about the revenue teams. Our, our panelists are mostly involved with the revenue departments, but we'll, we'll be touching on how revenue sales and marketing departments as well have been sort of turned upside down by the pandemic. So with that said, I'm gonna introduce our panelists. Um, Dean Chapman is with us on audio only. A uh, little technical difficulties this morning, but we're gonna roll with it. Uh, Dean is VP of Revenue Management at Vagabond and he's our star here. Um, Vagabond has 26 hotel, franchises 26 hotels. Uh, Dean has been with them for over 30 years and personally oversees the, the revenue distribution strategy at six of those. Uh, Nicole Adair is Director of Revenue Management Services at SHR. Uh, she's been with SHR for six years, and prior to that, she was with Aqua Aston Hotels. And finally, we've got Tom Colthurst, Senior Director of Distribution Strategy at Oracle. Uh, Tom's been with Oracle for two and a half years. Prior to that, he spent 20 years at Synexus slash Sabre, Tom's claim to fame is that he did the beta install of Opera 23 years ago. Welcome guys, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Hello. So we're gonna start with, like I said, Dean, the star of the show here. He's the guy that we're gonna learn the most from. Uh, Dean with Vagabond in. So Dean, tell us a little bit about Vagabond, if you will. Sure, it's, it's a West Coast brand. Um, limited service, uh, mid-scale, lower mid-scale hotels um, kind of uh, thrive on the leisure travel market. <laughs> uh, we're not big business hotels, so uh, that's kind of where we get our, our, our bread and butter from is uh, the leisure travel. Um, but yeah, that's the, in a nutshell, that's what it is. It's been around for 50 years and uh, that's, that's where I call my work. <laughs> yeah, so on the, so you mentioned leisure driven hotels, which Probably a good thing in today's in today's market, right? We're seeing a lot of the the business uh, demand has dried up. Has that been a, a positive for you guys? Have you been able to sort of maintain some consistency because of that? Actually, not even not even that was uh, reliable. The problem the problem is is that the governor um, has his place California <laughs> locked down for the, the almost the whole year. You know, there's a lot of travel restrictions. You can't go so many miles. Not to mention a lot of people just didn't want to venture out uh, for leisure to, to, at the risk of their health. Um, you know, we even had cities close down hotels. Uh, we had that happen in Palm Springs. We had that happen 
um, uh, up in Truckee. So we've had have had problems where that just uh, the market wasn't conducive to any sort of business, with with one exception. Uh, they we <laughs> for a few of our hotels we did. Um, arrange some lease options with different counties to help isolate uh, people in transition, so. Well, that's great. Well, I'm gonna ask you more about that later and how that's going for you guys. Perfect. Um, but I wonder if you can, Dean, tell us a little bit about how your organization is set up. So do you have a team there at Revenue? Uh, do you have a Revenue team there? Do you work closely with sales? Do you work closely with marketing? Are you guys, I know a lot of questions I'm throwing at you, but I was hoping you can just kind of describe how the organization is set up. Is it centrally sure. managed and you sort of push directives down to the hotels or tell, uh, me how, yeah. tell me how that organization structure works for you guys? Yeah, uh, we, we are centrally managed. We're not centrally located. We, we used to work out of an office, uh, <laughs> um, but for cost-cutting reasons, we, we, we uh, all work remotely now, which has been uh, an interesting transition. Uh, uh, ownership uh, always demanded that the office was where you needed to be if you worked here, and um, he's oh, really open to the new idea of this uh, teleconferencing. So I'm happy for that because I'm uh, about 400 miles from the office, <laughs> so that saves some travel for me. Uh, I don't have a team anymore. Uh, I used to have two people that would assist. Uh, we do still have marketing. Uh, we have some sales. But uh, as far as the revenue team goes, you're talking to them, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's, I think everybody got more added to their plate because the resources are limited. Uh, there was concerns, you know, there's debt coverage. There's a lot of things that are going on that uh, forced a, uh, a pretty aggressive reaction to the situation. And so everything that wasn't helping was let go and everything that wasn't critical was let go. <laughs> and so uh, we sit here today at a, a skeleton crew and we're probably more efficient given that fact because uh, of the situation. You know, we, we've knuckled down and focused more on hotel operations um, than ever before. So. It's been interesting. It's been it's been a good change of events. So just to follow up to that, Dean, how has your day to day role sort of been changed or affected by by that? Well, the the role is uh, changed a little bit with regard to uh, I'm doing uh, all the calls myself with each hotel. Mm -hmm. um, there was a mandate from ownership too that he wanted to move towards. Uh, RMS for the hotels and before it was done kind of the old-fashioned way we were really familiar with the hotels we were extremely familiar with the markets many years of experience so we felt fairly comfortable that we weren't missing many opportunities um, and so uh, you know I, it's been my goal to uh, learn different systems uh, one being wave but also you know things like teams where teams is second nature to us um, you know, just a whole host of digital ways to communicate and, you know, we'd have a lot of internal meetings now. It's, it's actually a lot more efficient. It really, it, it's, it really is because if you want to talk to somebody, you don't have to get up and go to their office. You just you know, dial off from your computer and they open it up and you're there. Um, see, I'm sure I'm off track. What was the rest of the question? Um, yeah, so I think you answered most of it, to be honest, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious you know, and this may be um, an elementary question, but I'm, I'm curious myself and I imagine people on our audience are as well. So when you say, you know, you're in communication with, with the hotels fairly often, you know, how often are you on, uh, on calls with the hotels and what are those conversations about? I mean, in sure. addition to, I imagine you guys have a weekly revenue meeting with each of them, but in addition to that, how, how often are you in communication with the property level and who are you speaking to at the property? Um, I'm in communication with all the hotels once a week. Uh, I have a small group of hotels that I'm directly responsible for, so I talk to those uh, folks uh, uh, more frequently. Um, and a big part of my time is on revenue calls, and uh, that's so that's kind of how that's going. The the new the, you know the new change is also that you know that we want to uh, from a revenue perspective we want to do more rate management uh, through software uh, before the manager would spend time i would spend time we would look at pickup we would look at pace we would look at everything you know, going out uh, at the demand and try to uh, price appropriately 
and that's a it's a time it's a time consumer and in the efficient you know the effort of being more efficient and being more on top of it we we saw the need for uh, a solution that would be more vigilant <laughs> and more reactive and um you know so we can cut our call times down um to about half an hour as opposed to an hour we also are uh giving the managers an extra half hour in their day. They're also multitasking, doing more with less. So, um, you know, it's become a, a winning solution to replace the two people and to you know pay for the hours of used time from all the managers. Uh, you know, what used to be, cons you know, referred to as a, an expensive option is not so expensive. Um, so it's been working out really well. Awesome. Thanks for all that, Dean. Thanks for sort of walking us through how the organization is set up. I think that all, you know, provide a good framework for the rest of our conversation. I want to turn to Nicole and ask you, Nicole, how, you know, some of SHR's clients are set up as well. Are you seeing a lot of the same, um, you know, sort of restructuring or, or reorganizing the day-to-day -day responsibilities with, with your other clients? Yeah, so for our revenue management clients, um, when you're talking at kind of a, a management or corporate level, the larger clients, there's definitely been a, you know, a pronounced shift towards more centralization, but, and this is a bit of an oxymoron, but kind of a, a distributed centralized team, right? So everybody is remote. Like Dean said, people at this point have gotten very, very comfortable with the, the working remotely, the different um, technology solutions, you know, to let you still do that very effectively. Um, but they have definitely scaled down the team um, from a revenue management perspective, the larger groups, you know, brought that back a little bit more central where they may have used to have had an on-property dorm at all of their larger properties. Oh, you know, a lot of that's been been brought back. Um, I do anticipate that as more demand from kind of the, the business side, business travel, when international travel can resume, when you start seeing some more of that business come back that most of those hotels will, again, have somebody on property because it's necessary. Um, but there's been a definite shift towards consolidating and bringing that team kind of in-house at the, at the corporate level. Yeah, and you, you walked right into my next question, which was, and I'll ask everybody on the panel here, um, is this sort of, and I know it's somewhat of a tough, a tough question, but I think we can be as transparent as possible. Is this something that we see staying for a while, these changes and this sort of centralization of, of strategy. Um, you know, is it, are they changes that we think have been made and we've been able to adjust to, and now ownership is going to say, listen, we can operate this way, we can operate remotely, we can operate with maybe a, a, a few, you know, less, less people, fewer staff, um, and we're gonna keep it this way for a while, or as demand picks up, are we going to be on a, 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 a scramble to hire people? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask you, Tom, that question. And you know, I'm not sure exactly how you're related to that, but maybe just your opinion, your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, I think I, I might turn it around a little bit and just, you know, really start to understand as the, you know, my understanding really about the travelers changing and their behaviors changing and, and the impact that really has. And I, I think that, benefits the centralization to some extent because there's more control at that point and the hotels aren't off maybe doing their own things with um, and they can have that centralization. I guess my question for Nicole and Dean on that is as we start to see more different behaviors of travelers as they're doing maybe more business and leisure combined travel, maybe they're doing longer stays, staying in country for the, a period of time, what does that mean for you know, short-term rentals, longer stays, alternative accommodations, does it help them to have that centralized revenue management person so that you can uh, better understand what's happening in the market and react faster? I'll let you take that, Nicole. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> it's a really interesting question and partially because that touches on ops too, right? And that's going to be a huge change from the ops perspective, not necessarily just revenue management um, I do think the centralization when you're talking about leisure business is much easier to accomplish and to do so efficiently and effectively. Um, I, I really see the, the change again with moving back towards on property for the larger hotels, city center, 
um, you know, business in group heavy hotels that will need that person there and in market um, as that as that demand comes back. But you know, the the longer term, the leisure travel, things like that, that actually makes it a little less dynamic in some instances from the revenue management standpoint. And I think that will, from that side, continue to lend itself to being able to manage more centrally. The one thing that I do think that will stay with all of this is the comfort level with having a distributed team, yeah. which is great because there's so much revenue management talent that's going to be available and not necessarily, you know, in market or things like that. I think that will open up a lot of opportunities both for the for job seekers and for hotels as well looking for talent that we have kind of raised that comfort level with managing that way yeah i'm going to shift that question over to you dean because we we were talking about this a little bit uh on a prep call and you really have an interesting sort of um i don't know if it's perspective but an interesting situation where um when we're talking about airbnb and short-term rentals and whether they are increased competition for your hotels, you guys actually have a, a couple of hotels that are listed on Airbnb. So I'm curious your your kind of thoughts on this, you know, the whole increased competition from short-term rentals and how it's affecting your operations. Yeah, sure. No, that's exactly true. Uh, we There's a couple locations we experimented with. They're, they're independents. There's some lifestyle hotels that are on the beach. And uh, uh, Hail Mary at the point at the time was to see how Airbnb would work out for us. Uh, Airbnb does allow hotels to join. Uh, they're a little backed up as far as onboarding. Um, you know, it, it's it's been <laughs> surprisingly lucrative. They, uh, there is demand, uh, even though it's a hotel. People, you know, people still uh, book and stay with our locations. They're, you know, they're they're nice locations. They're great hotels, but it has turned out to be a pretty nice little windfall um, of opportunity. And um, you know, it, there's a little bit. Uh, to learn, you know, in you know how to price, how to set the rules to avoid, you know, uh, coolers and barbecues and a hundred people in the room. But you know, other than that, it's it's been very, uh, very, uh, a very good move. Worked out well. Awesome. You know, something I don't want to move too far from from Tom's question because I think it was a great question. But this sort of idea of work from anywhere or or leisure quote unquote leisure right i think we've all probably done it right you take a business trip and you know maybe you're you, you've got things to do for work wednesday thursday friday and you take a half day friday and you bring your kids and, and your wife or your partner along and and you stay for an extra day or two um is that something you think we'll see more of now that we can kind of work from anywhere um maybe i'll start with nicole and and I'm wondering if your clients are seeing this, and then Dean, I'll ask you if you guys are seeing it at Vagabond. Okay. Yeah, it, it's definitely increased. And I think kind of almost every hotel, when this first started, wanted to put out an offer of, you know, hey, we have desks here, come and use our internet and it's quiet and, you know, you can escape your family and have, have peace and work. Um, you know, I, I think that was pretty common for hotels to attempt, but, it, you know, exactly to Tom's point, um, and Dean Chu with the success on Airbnb, you know, you are going to see that combination. And then also just the increase, I think, in kind of family travel and having to appeal to that market as a hotel and compete with houses on Airbnb or entire apartments because they're, you know, one of the big driving forces in this return to demand from leisure is going to be the entire family, you know, and how hotels are going to have to be able to address the parents with the three kids and the one hotel room competing against, like I said, a hotel, I mean, a, a house or an apartment and just how they can address that. Hopefully their F&B outlets are, you know, starting to reopen and they have have that um, to use, um, but they're going to have to get creative um, to go after, go after that market. Well, that was my follow-up question. So when you say they have to get creative, what are some things from a marketing perspective that they can to can do to target that audience? Oh, from a marketing perspective, I know one of one of our hotel clients, what they've actually started doing is kind of bundling their rooms almost. So looking at when they wouldn't normally have had, um, I don't even call them like pseudo room types, but you know, kind of creating suites out of their rooms. And a lot of hotels don't have that, you know, the door, the, the lock off in between anymore, but figuring out a way to really offer guests the ability to kind of have a home away from home in your hotel. So just how you're packaging your offerings, um, 
and just really, really speaking to the cleanliness standards, the processes in your hotel, the safety, all the things like that, that maybe would give a hotel an edge over just a random house, you know, and just looking for those differentiators and really trying to highlight those on their website. The one benefit of all this is that people, they're still looking on hotels and meta, but they are going to websites because they really have to feel comfortable with your product. Yeah. And that's something a hotel can do that, you know, a, a listing on Airbnb can't. Yeah, one thing I'll interject is I was speaking to a hotel here that's got an interesting strategy. What they're doing is, so, uh, you know, if you booked a two night or three night stay, um, on that last day, the day that, you know, when, when it's time for you to check out that morning, they'll send you an offer and say, Hey, since you don't have an office to go back to, um, would you be interested in staying another day or another day or two to, and, and we'll give you that at a discount at, at a discounted rate. And they've seen some, some real success with that, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. Dean, I'm wondering, um, your thoughts on that sort of leisure traveler. Is there, are there things that you can do to, to attract them? That's uh, I didn't know it, but I guess I've been a bleasure pro for a lot of years. <laughs> um, <laughs> unknowingly, uh, I've many many a business trip I've taken family, but uh, yeah. currently it's yeah no the the work remote, but the work anywhere is an opportunity, and uh, certainly vacations can turn into another day at the office pretty quickly and easily for the whole family. So. Uh, we, you know, we've done a few of those uh, suggestions that, that Nicole mentioned. We, we have, we've, you know, we even dabbled in day rate at a few locations to, you know, offer, you know, get away from your house, you got a business meeting, come on down, use our facilities. We have a gym, we have, you know, a pool, we have free internet, we have everything you need um, to, you know, that, that didn't work so well at most of our locations, unfortunately. But we, we were swinging at everything, and uh, including the departure day offer. Uh, you know, we usually try and pitch that. You know, we know the demand, we know what's on the books. We try and pitch that at check-in uh, mm -hmm. because day of departure sometimes they're already packed or they don't even yeah. stop by the office. So we, we make those offers available. Uh, you know, including you know uh, through Instagram, we do Facebook, you know, we all the social media outlets, we, we, we try to communicate and reach those guests and provide those uh, unique, uh, not traditional offers, uh, wellness retreats. We, you know, we've, we've, we've tried to craft everything we could think of to create demand and interest and uh, to get some share back in the hotel. Tom, I'll move that back over to you for any sort of last minute thoughts on sort of this work from home and, and leisure uh, trend before we move on. Yeah, no, I think Nicole kind of was spot on and, you know, the hotels kind of having to reimagine all their spaces, right? So whether it's the, whether it's the lobby, whether it's the restaurant, you, you, you can't stay with what you thought those spaces were going to be used for. And whether it's an office, whether it's a family gathering, uh, whether it's just one individual using a room, uh, even things like how your food and beverage is being used and takeaway and ghost kitchens you just have to really i think step back and you know from our perspective here at oracle some of that is really that that work from anywhere not only applies as we've talked about already to the to the guests but it's really about the hotel employee and can they can they interact with that guest from anywhere and it's not just a walk up to the front desk uh perspective it's you know being able to walk around with their own device or with some sort of mobile device and as you start to reimagine those spaces, what does all that look like? And now you've got a business traveler that used to be a leisure traveler that becomes a business traveler again, all in one stay. So having that, mo that ability to work with mobile devices, have your employees work from anywhere, even when they're at the property, um, I think is a, a really important piece about all of this. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Tom. And, and maybe I'll ask you a follow-up question there. And Nicole touched on it a little bit too about, you know, the 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 trust factor, right? The like the ability to let the guests know that things that your your hotel is safe, and um, you know, cl clean. You know, what's what's Oracle doing to help facilitate that? I mean, not so much on the, I guess, partly on the communication front, but also on the. Um, you know, contact list front and, you know, making sure that we're sharing or we're, we're not sharing physical space as much as possible. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the contact list one is the, uh, the obvious place where we're working with a lot of partners 
you know, we have just opened up all of our APIs through the Oracle marketplace so vendors can have access to those APIs to enable their products, which a lot of that is around the contactless experience of, of check-in, payments, and those things the guests can do. I think it's important to think about the guest journey, right? So my best stays have always been those that are seamless, where I show up at the hotel, I get to the room, everything works, I get a meal, I go to the gym, and there's almost no interaction other than things that make my stay better. So I think that's what we're really focused on is that uh, allowing and hotels to enable the systems they need to enable for that contactless journey, whether we're opening up APIs or if they're using, in our case, Opera Cloud to allow um, the efficiencies for the hotel employee, right? Because we don't want people just stuck at their desk in an office. We want them engaged with the hotels. And I think that goes back to my previous comment, which is stepping back and just reimagine what that guest experience is so that you can uh, maybe do things differently with your systems, your workflows, and if your products can enable that, it can really help. Um, and I think anywhere where you can add automation, uh, whether it's through revenue management or uh, other areas, I think that can be a huge benefit. And we're spending a lot of time on automation and AI. And, you know, there's this whole, I think Nicole touched on it, and I won't go too deep here, but, you know, we provide the ability to offer upgrades through what is, mm -hmm. was, is NOR1 upgrades. And that automation is just one more piece that used to happen maybe at the front desk that you can now automate through that touchless experience and that you can automate through the entire guest journey, which just adds a ton of efficiency. And then from a revenue manager perspective, adding revenue, right? Which at the end of the day, there's a lot of great conversations around how everything can be new and different, but we still want to make some money for the hotel, right? And what can you do that is additive to the, to the rev par, to the revenue for the hotel? Dean, curious your thoughts on that. Your, your thoughts on what Tom was mentioning there, the idea of upselling at, uh, at the point of check-in or actually you could do it before the guest arrives, right? Um, is that something you guys are looking into and how are you making the most of that checking and experience and even pre-arrival experience to, to get the most from the guest? Sure. Um, you know, we, we've uh, always upselled, uh, always it was, you know, face to face. Um, you know, what, <laughs> what he was describing was uh, ownership's, uh, you know, perfect world. He, He's also of the opinion that uh, the contactless check-in is going to be the preferred method. Um, I'm probably too old school, been around too long. I think hospitality still means uh, some hospitality. I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. personally think everybody wants to just check into a box and not talk to anybody. I think they're there to enjoy the experience. And you know, of course, I deal with leisure more than business. So I think those two different uh, uh, guest types have different needs to be met. So, uh, you know, I, I, there's always a lot of interaction, you know, where's the place to go for dinner? Where's the beach at? How do you get down to here? So I don't know that that's going to change a whole lot. Um, but, you know, I've been uh, <laughs> educated before. You, Dean. Don't worry. I totally agree with you. I think it's just less about the front desk and the how do I get my room key and sign a registration card? That, sure. that all that can be taken care of ahead of time. And it's more about the how can the employees spend more time to improving someone's experience. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, I don't want to get too technical here, but I'm curious your thoughts from a PMS perspective. I've often wondered this, you know, not to throw any company under the bus, but there are what, there are all of a sudden a hundred guest messaging apps, right? There are, there are, they popped up like crazy, right? Like whether that's SMS based or email based or WeChat or whatever, you know, however they want to message the guests as they arrive on property, whether that's to check them in or to get them more towels or whatever may, they, may, they need. Why, what, what's the importance of those technologies connecting to the PMS? Yeah, I, I, I think it's important that um, a guest has the ability to chat with the hotel in their preferred method, yeah. if possible, right? So there's, you know, and you see this across verticals, right? So uh, whether you look at food and beverage 
uh, out there in the world or retail, they're all kind of just coming up against the fact that, and, and maybe just realizing uh, because of the pandemic that WhatsApp is a thing, if you will, right? And people want to use WhatsApp and how can they converse with that uh, person through WhatsApp? Uh, and then even then, how can they actually do commerce, right? So how can they do actual transactions and make money uh, through that? So we see that in a broad range of uh, various verticals happening, whether it's WhatsApp or WeChat or whatever. So yeah, I think we see that as an important piece of how can we integrate uh, messages uh, to the appropriate employee in the future? Uh, how can we leverage our APIs to enable other systems to do that that can sit um, on top of, on beside, or embedded within uh, the PMS uh, by using the kind of the open APIs uh, allowing those custom those people to really enable uh, the products for the hotels uh, without dictating kind of one way right because ultimately there's you know how many of those different systems are there worldwide and who wants to use what we have to be able to service all countries all yep. different localities and languages so there'll be a lot of different vendors providing different ways to handle that yep Hey, Nicole, uh, Tom mentioned a word that I think we hear a lot of more and more and more and probably multiple times a day, and that's automation. I think that's a big part of, of, this, of this chat, right, of, of making things more efficient for hoteliers on the back end. What, how is SHR sort of approaching automation as it, as it ties into sort of the, uh, the tie-in between revenue management and property management? Right. So, and, and this actually, I really liked Tom's point um, about opening up those APIs and making it so all of this can connect because especially with reduced teams, like no one wants to introduce inefficiencies, right? By having this messaging service and this messaging service and you have to log in, you have to respond here and respond here. Um, from a revenue management perspective, it's just really all about being able to free up the revenue management team, if there is one, or just that person, to really focus on strategy and the kind of market conditions and things that are happening that a computer cannot know, right? We don't, we, we don't want to see revenue managers or GMs, you know, depending on who's handling that at the property, spending their time having to compile data from five different systems and put it in a spreadsheet and, you know, pivot it out and, um, have to spend all this time manually. So really trying to you know, introduce efficiencies there from, from reporting from a data standpoint so people can draw insights faster, but also the efficiencies that can come with um, small, small rate adjustments and really being able to yield that rate appropriately um, to get some of the small incremental um, increases in revenue that, that come with that, that a, a person does not have time to do, you know, regardless of how good of a revenue manager they are, you can't look 365 days out every single day, multiple times per day and say, well, could this day be $4 more, you know, that kind of thing. So bringing that technology to the users to allow machine learning and AI to, to handle those pieces and automate those things so that, again, the revenue manager, the GM can really focus on, on strategy, on running the hotel, um, and being able to adapt to all the changes that we're all constantly seeing still right now. And I think that is a perfect transition to ask Dean whether that's a reality, right, Dean? So <laughs> you've, you've, I think you mentioned that you're sort of in the process or you're, you, you started the process not too long ago of moving from manual to relying on a system to make some of these recommendations for you. But, um, how has that affected how you revenue manage at, at your properties? Are you relying more on the system or, and how has that, how have you sort of adapted to that? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great comment uh, made by Nicole and it, it's a hundred percent true. Yeah. The, the transition is made to automation and her example is right on off my, my note sheet here is that we see opportunity through incremental changes, you know, the $1 up, $2 up, even sometimes $1 down to drive RevPAR uh, to, be, to, to capture as much share on any given day as possible. And, you know, with this black swan, aka COVID, you know, it's been a pretty disruptive uh, situation that includes travel patterns, I believe. And so 
I, you know, I was a little bit uncomfortable coming into this year, not knowing, you know, when will it come back? You know, what are, this, are we going to see the traditional kind of peaks and valleys? And I, I really felt that this would be a good opportunity to uh, embrace that technology, but also have those vigilant eyes, as I mentioned earlier, always watching pace and pick up and, and just to help me stay on top of the opportunities or the lack of opportunities and adjust accordingly. So yeah, no, I, I, it's, uh, it's exactly exactly the reason we, we've made the move because um, I think it's gonna be necessary moving forward and it's gonna be one less thing <laughs> that everybody has to worry about. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned something earlier, Tom, I want to go back to, or, or Dean, I'm sorry, I want to go back to a little bit. And, you know, with this, and it's the idea of, you know, centralization or moving a lot of these um, decisions um, to, to corporate or above property, if you will. Um, you lose, do, do you lose some of that in-market experience? And I think you talked about this a little bit, Dean, about, you know, do, the, do, do you know the markets as well? As, as you used to. I mean, you, you, you are a couple hundred miles away from each of your hotels, but it sounds to me like you know your hotel markets well. Um, when, when we move to the centralization strategy, is there sort of a fear that we lose some of that in-market expertise and how do we make up for it? Yeah, no, that is a concern, but as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, I still plan on having, uh, you know, 15 to 30 minute call weekly to be, to touch base, to get grounded back with the hotel with the markets, with the events, uh, with what's happening, you know, you know, what's the buzz, you know, is there any interest? So that's gonna be, that's gonna be, a, I think a critical step. I don't think I can ever be each in a box uh, onto myself and, and make these decisions without communication. Um, so, uh, you know, the communication now though is with teams, it's, it's a lot more, it's eye to eye, it's voice to voice, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's improved. And so it's, um, like I said, this, this change of efficiency is, you know, out of necessity has become a great uh, working model to, to reinvent ourselves and become more more on top of things and more efficient. So yeah, I, 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 I can't lose that touch. So. Same question for you, Nicole. I'm wondering, you know, when we say in that in-market experience or that in-market expertise, or, you know, somebody may, at property may know their market better than somebody who sits remotely, what are some of those things that you need to know about what's going on in your market? Dean mentioned events. Um, what are some of the other things that, uh, you know, when, when we say this in-market expertise, what are we sort of talking about there from a revenue perspective? Right, well, and that looks different depending on the type of hotel in the market, right? But when I think about it with our clients and where I absolutely see it going back to the property level, um, most of them still maintain sales at the property level through this in at least one role, but you're really talking about relationships within the market, right? And for your larger hotels, convention hotels, things like that, there's relationships with the CDB, with the other hotels. Um, you know, from a corporate standpoint, just the, the corporate travel managers and if they have offices in the city, you know, really having that personal relationship that's very important. Um, with, with people in your market and in your city and the people within the industry in your city, um, that's, it's just crucial, you know, especially as that type of demand comes back to really knowing what's going on. Um, and, you know, that's, there will always be that role and that need um, for, for those type of hotels, for sure. Yeah, and a lot of that comes back to data too, right? So, so when we talk about having data on your, mar on your market and your competitors in your market, right, and setting up your comp sets, um, Tom, I'm curious, have you, do you have any anecdotal experience on that? Are, are comp sets changing today for hoteliers or in, in this sort of idea of having data on your market? Is, is that evolving? Yeah, I think, well, in general, I think it's back to what Nicole talked about earlier, which is it's um, trying to understand data and how we can leverage data and use AI and machine learning. Yeah. And and really understand where we can take out the human maybe mistakes, if you will, out of what they're trying to decide and really put some facts behind it that can automate those decisions and then really figure out the best ways to, to use that local on-property in-market experience to, to drive the the models uh, so that that system can really learn and and work for you so you know our like i said earlier a lot of what we're looking at from an ai and machine learning perspective 
um, is just that, right? Like just how to adjust those models so that they can work for various market segments and then apply local localized information to them. Um, so that's what we do when we look at upgrades like we talked about before. Um, and in the yeah. pandemic, world, we did see, by the way, just to give a sense of where travelers are changing their behaviors, because we talked about that a little bit, you know, that's one of the things that we're seeing, because Nicole and Dean talked about it both, that there's this need to go directly to the hotel for information, which allows for the hotel to collect more data, because now they're touching their website and they're doing availability searches, so now they can get more data. And then we're also seeing from that more people wanting to know about upgrades and to want to know more information about the hotel and, and shopping more directly with the hotel. And we can collect that data and then apply that data for that as well. Yeah, I don't know why, I don't know why Tom, but I'm leaning on you as our, as our sort of IT, our tech guy here in, in the conversation. So when sure. we talk about, you know, sort of that, that making sure we've got that right data, it requires data being shared properly between multiple systems, right? And that always hasn't been easy for the hospitality industry. I mean, you've been in the industry for, for decades. You know that this has always been a challenge for hotels and hoteliers and technology systems is sharing the right data in real time. You know, what kind of advance, advances have, have we made in particular on, particularly between the PMS and the RMS in, in sharing, you know, what data needs to flow properly between those? And, you know, talk to me about, you know, the difference between a one-way and a two-way integration, some of those sure. things that... Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's about efficiency, like you talked about, right? So um, if, we, if we talk about, like, getting rid of the swivel chair, right? So, you know, yeah. speaking directly to some of the revenue managers here, um, you know, they may be changing their price, but all of a sudden, they may not have the integration in place that allows them to just change that in one place, and it updates everywhere for them, and that they're logging into multiple systems because there isn't compatibility potentially about how they're revenue managing between their booking engine to their distribution platform to their property management system that they end up in this kind of swivel chair uh, perspective so for us it's really about that two-way connectivity and you know we've had uh, at oracle consistently really good integration with other systems around availability and rates and and reservations to try and avoid uh, that swivel chair access so that a revenue manager can just, let's say, work just in their PMS and know that it's updating uh, those other systems. And we have a lot of rate and availability controls that the revenue managers would use. So for the people on the call, I would say that's kind of the where the efficiency lands, which is how can you kind of determine where you're going to be working and avoid the swivel chair if you did a time on task with employees and just started to look at how many times are they touching a reservation before that guest can check in. See if you can try to remove some of that, that manual piece and some of that might be able to happen through automation. And we know we have areas that we need to improve. I, I'm the pillar chair for h on, um, on distribution. And there's you know, ways that we need to improve interfaces and what we exchange back and forth. And that's one of the reasons like, you know, Nicole said she was glad to hear we had opened up our APIs, but that was really one of the ways, reasons for that is to make sure that we don't have that swivel chair and we can improve efficiencies and we can make systems work better together. I think from the revenue management standpoint, um, from the systems, those revenue management systems, I think what's going to happen there is uh, they're going to have to keep up because hotels are going to start selling differently, right? So all of a sudden we're starting to talk about selling by time-based increments, we're talking about selling by attribute-based selling, uh, and we're talking about more add-ons and, and different packages and selling rooms together that aren't really sweet. And those systems are gonna have to evolve and learn new data probably to, to be more efficient. Yeah, Nicole, I'm gonna turn to you. I, you know, I love this idea of the swivel chair. You know, I just picture uh, a front desk clerk with three different monitors managing their revenue here and their check-ins here and, you know, their upgrades here or their guest messaging here. Give me some real, real world examples on that. I mean, is that, is that, do you have, do, have you dealt with hotels in the past who, who do that and, you know, through SHR's efforts um, to make sure that that data is integrated properly and the systems are integrated prop properly, are we getting better? 
at, at, at sort of being more efficient with that. And I guess part B of that question is to, to Tom's, to Tom's point, you know, we're really, we're looking at rates, availability, and, and you know, mostly inventory stuff. But I know with SHR's efforts in introducing a CRM and, um, there's more to it than that, right? There's a lot of guest preferences and guest profiles that we're sharing among systems. Are, are we advancing in those efforts? <laughs> let me see, let me go back to the first part yeah. of that question. Um, from a revenue management perspective, especially when we're working with new clients, that's one of the first things we look at is how is your distribution functioning? And I think both of you kind of just said mouthfuls on that topic, right? And it's, it's a lot to dig into, but even something as simple as length of stay restrictions, you know, what, what can your PMS process, what does your CRS process, like what channels are you using? Some will only do a min arrive, some will only do a min stay through and just how you can actually um, execute your revenue management strategy with all of these different capabilities or different accepted messages in each system, right? So yes, we've had clients that, and some of it's just from a, a small cost savings perspective that will update every OTA, um, where am I blinking on the word? Extranet manually, right? And they don't interface to reservations because there's an extra cost with that. So you're, I mean, you're really, really increasing inefficiency to save, you know, a few dollars and cents here and there, but it's, it's surprisingly common. Um, and it's one of the first things we look at is how we can kind of bring all that together, get all that information flowing both ways, you know, and really looking at kind of a two way integration, especially from the reservations perspective, because it's really important that you have all that information coming in the system. Um, I know there's a lot of talk now about like Tom mentioned kind of the, um, well not, he didn't mention add-ons, but add-ons, um, kind of selling at the product level of like, I'm gonna charge more for this room over here in the corner and I'm gonna let my guests, you know, book it this way, like we do airline seats. And, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to say you're gonna manage that way. It's a whole other conversation of, can my tech stack support that? You know, or is that gonna be incredibly inefficient and create so many manual tasks trying to manage that? Um, so it's, it's just interesting seeing that evolve as we do move more towards that type of selling, that type of pricing is how the systems can keep up. Um, and keep those efficiencies from, from an SHR perspective. Yeah, I mean, that data is really important. We have been focusing on um, what we're calling our Force 10 engine, but creating kind of a, a big data lake that will sit in the middle of all of our products and also have the PMSs plug into that as well. So we have kind of, it's managing this big data lake that will only send the necessary information to, you know, each product or to the PMS, we'll, you know, getting what we need and kind of storing it in that centralized um, data lake. But yeah, really managing the data as well is kind of kind of the key piece, right? There's, there's so much data, um, so much that people think they need also that may just create noise in their systems. So really streamlining that, making sure that we're communicating what people need, um, but not adding complexity and noise at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, Dean, that data, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's critically important to you and your team as well, not only um, for revenue managing, right, for pricing and for forecasting, but really I think the goal we're all trying to get to is everybody on the team is working off the same sets of data, right? Whether that's marketing making decisions on need periods or operations making labor decisions based on these, you know, forecasts. Um, do you see that in your operations? Do you see revenue and marketing and ops and sales even sort of working more closely together than they were prior to the pandemic? And are we moving toward the point where we're making some, most of these decisions, hopefully based off of data? Yeah, no, I think we, we all are definitely uh, working closer together. Um, you know, the data piece, uh, the you know, it's, it's pretty limited right now with us. We, we, we see the need um, and, you know, we're, we're looking at a couple of options to meet that need, some business intelligence platforms to provide everybody the same uh, sheet of music, if you will, to look at labor and to look at pickup and to look at star ratings, uh, you know, indexes, all those metrics that we, we you know, we all like to consume daily. Um, so we all kind of 
see the same things. We're not there yet. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're, like I said, we're not kind of big time <laughs> in this fact, you know, most of our hotels are between 80 and hundred rooms. They're uh, all uh, limited service. So um, I say that mostly just because the investment hasn't been there. Um, but as I said, we we turned a corner and this, uh, this change in, in the industry has, has forced us to reevaluate that and the, the value of, of that approach, uh, more centralized, more uh, personal communication and uh, you know, decision process has, has become uh, the mantra. And we, we we're looking, we're, we're, we're slow to the, slow to the, uh, to the start, but we're, we're, we're picking up speed, so. Yep, great, great. So I'm gonna ask one last question. I'm gonna go around the, the room here and ask pan, uh, each, of the, each of the panelists to touch on, to sort of look forward a little bit, right? So let's end on how we think things are going to, to look moving forward on this uh, efficiency front, really basically on, on the recovery front uh, and our recovery efforts. Um, you know, I'm an optimistic person. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, I, I think it's with, with the increasing number of people vaccinated and restrictions opening, um, op opening up throughout the world. Um, from my perspective, I'm really um, trying to figure out how that's gonna translate to more travel, right? Or more people get, feeling comfortable getting back out on the road. Um, I, you know, I know leisure will come first and is coming first, and it may be a while for, for business travel to return. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, if, anybody, if everybody can sort of look at their own role and, you know, their own departments, um, how do you think um, things are shaping up? How do you think things will look uh, six months from now, maybe a year from now? Uh, get out your crystal ball, if you will. Um, Tom, I, don't, I wonder if I can start with you. Yeah, so I think I'll you know combine a little bit of what I've heard in some other conferences and and kind of what I do on a day to day basis with my with my job, which is really to ensure that uh, hotels can seamlessly activate and manage distribution channels and have control over their pricing on how they want to price. Like I talk to a lot of distribution channels, and it's really about ensuring that the brand can have its own voice and its own brand and how it markets itself through those channels. So, you know, that would be somewhat aspirational, but I think the, re the reality part for you, you know, that you're talking about in the next uh, 12 months is, I think there will be new ways that hotels are selling so that we can sell by time-based increment and we can sell by, by attributes, whatever that means for a particular uh, hotel. So I think that's real and uh, that will be a, ultimately a change that will stay with us. And then I think, you know, the, the behavior of that traveler is going to change. And, you know, I think meta is going to become uh, more important and there probably will be more direct bookings. So now is an opportunity for people to look at their, their channel mix and where they're driving uh, traffic. And I think there's probably an opportunity out there that somebody's going to leapfrog over the existing big guy OTAs uh, with some new ideas and, and new ways to sell. Uh, so that I think will be the kind of the, the crystal ball aspect of it to see, wait and see what happens from that perspective. So hopefully that helps. Tom, you're invited back. I think we could have a whole hour conversation on attribute based selling and hourly rates. And we'll, yeah, yeah. And if anybody we'll do that for the next conversation. Sign up for the HTG uh, working group if they really want to provide information. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Nicole, how do you see revenue management with your clients and in general evolving over the next year? You know, what, what, some of the, what, is, what some of these changes that have been brought on by the pandemic are with us to stay? And, you know, how do you see the, the discipline evolving in the next 12, 18 months or so? Well, as I mentioned, I do think some of the consolidation is going to be here to stay um, along with it. The distributed team and working virtually, I, you know, I think that's going to continue. I'm very hopeful that even just looking at a leisure perspective that for many hotels and many markets, we will be moving back towards more um, directing the demand versus trying to generate the demand, which, you know, which is a lot of the focus right now. Um, but this has really, really kind of forced revenue management, marketing, and sorry to all my D um, DOSs, but to a lesser extent sales just because of what the market is right now for a lot of hotels. But 
really kind of coming together on more of a commercial team, um, you know, and seeing that shift at the leadership level into a, a commercial role um, and working on a commercial team together at the, at the corporate level um, to continue to work more hand in hand, right? Because with the market segmentation changing, um, with, with the leisure, it just, it, it changes the role and how we're approaching marketing and how revenue management and marketing have to work together, um, both to decide what to target, how they're going to target and how they're going to price. Um, but that's, that's just critical and it's going to stay critical for years really as traditional um, demand starts to come back. Cause it's, it, you know, it, it's not going to be this year that we see everything coming back. So yeah. that's going to be with us for a while. So Dean, you're in the thick of it. I'm really curious to get your opinion on this. Are you guys seeing demand return at Vagabond? And you know, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? And how far out do you think it is until, well, I, I hate to say we return to normal because that's kind of a hard benchmark to, to go against, but how are th how's the forecast looking for you guys over the next year? Uh, optimistic, we are seeing uh, returning uh, business interest. Um, you know, I think the ramp up period is still going to be probably into 2022, probably the first quarter, hopefully to get in there, in there close. My bigger concern at this point is to uh, uh, try to lead some markets back up in rate. You know, when when the pickings get slim, everybody thinks dropping their rate, you know, is going to is going to bring more more stay. Um, and of course, they're just stealing share. Obviously, you know, if if your full service facility down the street is selling it you know, $3 more than you, it's, it's becomes a challenge. So I'd like to see everybody else go back to their, their resting level and uh, open the opportunity for us to get back into what we're comfortable at. Um, but that's, that's the biggest focus is making sure the rates are right and there we get every penny, every night, every room uh, as best we can. So, uh, but yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be still a little bit of a stretch. Uh, you know, I think things will obviously based on what I, what I'm hearing is that, anywhere between April and June, I think we'll see a lot of less restrictions and um, uh, hopefully people have money and interest to go out and see the United States, especially yeah, I mean, West Coast. I think you put it, I think you put it <laughs> perfectly, Dean. You know, for the time being, it's all about leading your market, right? It's all about making sure that your hotel is positioned properly to capture the demand when it does return. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you put that perfectly and best of luck to you and to everybody else on the call uh, moving forward. Again, I'm optimistic and I will check back in with each of you and, and see how things are going in six months. Um, I thought this was an awesome conversation, really enjoyed all the insight from everybody. So thank you so much uh, for taking the time. And with that, we will wrap. Thank Thanks, you guys. Great, thanks Jason.